Satish will start now. Good afternoon, dear friends, and a warm welcome from IIM Ahmedabad. My name is Sanjay Verma, and I am your host for today's talk. I am very happy to share with you that today we have Professor Satish Devdar, Faculty in Economics from IIM Ahmedabad. You can see him on the top left of uh, your screen. Hopefully, he's on top left of my screen and the screen, and I assume. It's so at your screen also. As I mentioned, Professor Devdhar or Satish, he teaches economics at IIM Ahmedabad. He has bachelor's and master's in economics from Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics, and also a PhD in agriculture economics from the Ohio State University. He has been a recipient of outstanding PhD dissertation award from the Food Distribution Research Society USA. He has also been honored with the Distinguished Young Professor Award for Excellence in Research by IMA in 2008 and the Devang Mehta National Education Award for Best Professor of Economics in 2012 and 2015 by Business School Affair. Satish has one imperfection though, and which is that he works on imperfectly competitive market structures. That's the only imperfection he has in his uh, CV profile. Uh, so he works on imperfectly competitive market structures, world trade organizations, agricultural trade, food quality and safety, and CSR issues. Besides that, he has conducted research projects for Indian Ministry of Food Processing Industry, Ministry of Agriculture, Indian Bank, and Economic Research Service of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. He was selected as Hewlett Fellow of the International Agricultural Trade Research Consortium during 2006 to 2008. He has published several research papers in national and international journals and authored quite a few monographs as well as books. His books are very interesting to read, by the way. In case you have not read the same, uh, please go ahead and read some of them and you will enjoy economics. One of his books, Day-to-Day -day Economics, has gone on to become national bestseller in the non-fiction category. The book is titled Economic Sutra, Ancient Indian Antecedents to Economic Thought. And that's what he's going to present today. He, personally, he's a very risk-taking person. Uh, he took the risk to lead the first computerized common revision test conducted by IIMs long ago. He has also held many administrative positions at IIM Ahmedabad. He has been chair for admissions, PGP, PGPX, placement, welfare, and warden. At present, he chairs our food and agribusiness management program. In addition to this, Satish is an excellent photographer. He likes photography and especially birds on campus. He writes poetry and his poetry are very good. And many times he will write extempore. And his poetry consists of humor. And you know, humor flows when he speaks. So it's always fun and joy talking to him. That's what Satish is. More you will know about him. You know, those of you who don't know, most of you may already know him. For others, Satish is present to you now. Satish, your thank you, Satish. Thank you for coming to us for this, for accepting our invitation and coming to our this uh, talk. Thank you. Okay. All right. May I begin, uh, Sanjay? Now. Yes. Yeah. I will just stop sharing my presentation, and I've yeah. done that. So. so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks, Sanjay, for that uh, very kind uh, introduction that you made. Uh, and for the, unfortunately, I think today's topic is a little serious one, but uh, well, economics is a dismal science. So I'll try to make it as light as possible, but it's a tough one. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is the following. As you know, already the topic uh, for today's webinar, uh, I'll divide it into four parts. One, first, I'll just share with you, you know, what motivated me to uh, do this uh, research and which I got published in a book also. So I'll just give you background as to what was the motivation, why would I go after this? You know, because all my specialization that uh, Sanjay mentioned, and I've never talked about this before. Last two, three years, I've been looking at uh, this uh, topic. So I'll give you the motivation part. Then I'll give you a brief, broad understanding of what the ancient Indian thought, uh, proto-economic thought is all about. Then I'll give you a few examples from Rigveda, Mahabharat, uh, and then I'll move on to what is the Kautilya's contribution. 
And finally, I think it's most important, what is the takeaway for us? Why should we look, look back in time? You know, is there something for us to take away from this uh, study? So this is the four-fold classification for my talk. Um, let me begin, let me just share my uh, slides with you so that uh, we go together while I'm speaking. Okay, so can, uh, I guess everybody would be able to see my uh, PPT presentation now. Yes, so this is my, yeah? Yeah, it's visible. Yeah, so uh, this is the topic, Ancient Indian Antecedents to Economic Thought. Uh, let me just begin by um, giving you the motivation part. Now, some of you, those uh, who have been, uh, uh, Sanjay, am I able to uh, control the uh, slideshow or you are doing it? No, you are doing it. When you change it, it will change. Yeah, it's in your control. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, right. Uh, so, you know, those who have studied economics at undergrad level, maybe you have taken a course on economic history. And generally, two famous books were assigned to us. One was History of Economic Thought by Eric Rohl, and the other was History of Economic Analysis by Schumpeter. Now, when you study this as a young graduate student, uh, undergraduate student, so you hear references to Old Testament, New Testament, Greco-Roman thought, mercantilists, physiocrats, and you stop at the classical economic thought. And then onwards is all about new economics. But you know, as a young student, uh, one wonders as to how come there is nothing about India in this. I mean, uh, you know, that's that's what actually you know that um, uh, thought stays with you until you continue your postgraduate studies, and uh, at some point in time, you uh, feel like you know I should go back to this topic. Um, and very recently, and that thought was there in my mind for quite some time. And very recently, in 2016, in one of the books. Uh, American economist Cowson, uh, he said, and I'm going to quote, and he said, before Adam Smith, 6,000 years of recorded history had passed without a seminal work on the subject that dominated every waking hour of practically every human being. And I thought this was too bombastic a statement, too extreme a statement to make because, you know, well, I think there must have been something that was contributed by Indians in the past as well. So uh, the curiosity was we are a country of continental proportions. We have a history of over 5,000 years. It just cannot happen that nobody thought about economic ideas in the past. And that was really a motivation for me to uh, study this. What I did was I checked out the modern Indian thinkers who have talked about our heritage. Right? I said, maybe I'll get some clues from there. Unfortunately, uh, during the colonial period and in the post-colonial world, the worldview was very pessimistic. Many of you must have heard of Macaulay. Macaulay had nothing great to say. Forget about great. He always thought that the Indians were secondary, their languages, their history, everything was extremely secondary. But even among the Indians, you know, the same pessimistic thought or a pejorative thought continued. For example, uh, no, there was, a, at the time of independence and a few say, uh, decades after that, there was a zeitgeist. Raj Krishna, the economist, he called the first three decades of India where the growth rate was extremely low. He called it a Hindu rate of growth. And then there's Deepak Lal, another famous economist, who said, oh, this is Hindu equilibrium. And what they meant was that somehow the Indian cultural moorings are such, historical moorings are such, that we are never going to get out of this rut. So we'll have extremely low GDP growth rates. And you can imagine if you are in my shoes as an undergrad student, an extremely depressing thought. And what, are, what is this? You know, we never thought about our economic material growth in the past. That can't be true. And the emphasis was basically that we were more about otherworldly attitudes. Moksha, Nirvana, and Buddhism, and Hinduism. And that is what the Indian tradition was, and that is how it was being portrayed. And therefore, we were not really making jumps in the material progress, and that is what it was coming out of this. In fact, if you really think what it was, Raj Krishna's Hindu rate of growth was really, with hindsight, it was a fig leaf for low socialist GDP growth rate. For the first three decades, four decades, all, almost up to five decades, you have so much control, this totalitarian control by like the Soviet Union. Planning Commission was there, it was controlling everything, markets were not allowed to play. 
and therefore we had a slow growth rate in fact those some of you who have uh, looked at india's history since independence economic history 800 uh, you know um, uh, items for production were reserved to small scale industry then at the other end the big um, big ticket items were in the public sector whether it's steel plants whether it's decor, many other things and private sector was squeezed in between and within the squeeze private sector there was license raj you have to get a license to produce something that means small monopolies were also created within that private sector in the middle that was really a reason for the slow economic growth rate and that was really a fig leaf for the socialist growth rate um, in fact you might heard you might have heard of b r shenoy he was the first indian to publish in quarterly journal but nobody knows about him because he opposed the socialist policies in the first two decades in fact he had a dissent note to the second five year plan and therefore he was but the zeitgeist of time was such that his voice was never heard he was hounded out to sri lanka he worked for some time in uh, wadia college pune for some time in uh, gujarat university in ahmedabad but he had to go to sri lanka and he was helping the sri lankan government and in 1966 he came out with a report how sri lanka should liberalize which of course it took 10 years for them to uh, you know, follow his guidelines but he was more useful to sri lankans than to indians so that is what has happened then i looked at a few other uh, thinkers and i'm sure again you have heard of discovery of india the book by uh, jawarlal nehru and he, while in 1940s uh, 1940s he was in i think ahmednagar jail and that's where he wrote the book and at that time kautilya still at that time he was known as a protagonist of the sanskrit flip in <clears throat> rashas so he was not a historical period of a person as such but just like in ramayana and mahabharata we have hello hello yes yeah. may i continue you are you are muted you continue there may be some disturbance we will take care of this okay Don't... all right yeah so kautilya was known more as a protagonist of the sanskrit play mudra rakshas not as a historical figure or not as an economist and therefore uh, nehru called him india's machiavelli right and machiavelli is a guy who wrote something in 17th century he was a french uh, aristocrat who was helping the government and he talked more mainly about the political continuance of the royalty he did not talk about economics as such so uh, later finally i chanced upon uh, a book by uh, kangle he uh, kangle is kautilya arthashastra he started writing it from 1965 onwards it was a series of first he, he prepared a critical text of uh, arthashastra in sanskrit then he did a literal translation and third was the commentary on it so from 65 onwards he did that and based on that manuscript now we know that kautilya is not just a character from the mudra rakshasa play it is not a fiction or imagination he was a person in flesh and bone who walked on this planet around 350 bc and he has written this uh, treatise so that was a revelation to us actually therefore bakhiveli should be called kautilya of italy because kautilya wrote two millennia prior to bakhiveli and he talked not about just continuance of the rule of the uh, existing king but he talked about administration economic policies markets and many other things so it should be the other way around and then uh, as the luck would have it uh, you know my mother is a sanskrit scholar and whenever i visit her uh, she keeps asking me something about what i am doing so once she asks me sadish do you know uh, kalidas and immediately i pounced of course in a meghadoot i know meghadoot abhya a romantic novel where the um, angel sends message through a cloud to his fiance in himalayas he said that's fine but do you also know that he talked about that same cloud as a government treasury i said no so he said she said you why don't you read raghuvamsha and then you'll get to know so that was honest i said my god if somebody is talking about um, Uh, the cloud as a government treasury in another novel of his of a drama raghuvamsham that means in the 4th century the idea that government taxes people must be already known in the society only then kalinsa would have uh, talked about it right but this one thing led to another and therefore i thought no no i should go beyond this there will be enough literature let me just read everything 
so that's how you know the, that's the motivation part how I got into this. Uh, let me give a brief background. If you look at the standard economics textbooks, you know they talk about each individual or a household going by self-interest and trying to maximize uh, utility if you are a consumer and trying to maximize profit if you are a firm. So that's the standard uh, assumption that we make. And it's a unidimensional objective, either utility maximization or profit maximization. It works most of the time. However, this objective is irrespective of the stages of life we are in, irrespective of the occupation we are in. And it's not just, it's just a unidimensional objective. There may be more than one objective, right? So therefore we try to look at what this could be. So if you look at the standard economics, are your utility on the vertical axis, consumption on the horizontal axis. And then, you know, so many of you, those who have taken economics would know there's a law of diminishing marginal utility as you consume more, total utility goes up, but you know, at the margin, more, less and less is being added. Fair enough, but this is a unidimensional concept. Now, if you look at uh, the ancient literature, Indian literature, what they're talking about is three things. There are four, four objectives of life, which are called Purusharthas. And then once you have these objectives, these objectives, while you're pursuing, you go through four, four, four stages of life, which are called ashramas. And then you have four, four professions in life, which we call as varnas, or at least the ancient people call them as varnas as profession. Now, if you follow these things, so there are actually what's happening here is there are 64 combinations. You have four objectives, four stages of life, and four uh, professional folds. That means four times four times four, there are total 64 combinations possible, and each could choose what he or she wants to become, right? So to give you an example, so this is a holistic concept. It's not a single objective in mind. So to give you a little background to this, let's suppose I talked about this three-dimensional figure, and let's say on the vertical axis, you have Purusharthas, and what are these Purusharthas? You are supposed to have Dharma, and by Dharma, I don't mean religion. The true meaning of Dharma means uh, righteous conduct or ethical conduct, right? So that's Dharma. So one objective is that everybody should follow Dharma or righteous conduct. Of course, you need Artha, you need money to survive. And Kama means pleasures of life. And fourth is Moksha. So the idea was if you do first three right, you know, you earn money, you have pleasures of life, but at the same time, you have ethical behavior in the society. If you have good balance of these, probably you're going to have Moksha as well. So these are the four objectives. While one is trying to achieve these four objectives, the time is progressing. You're going through four ashramas. First, you were a child, or you became a young adult, you were brahmachari, then you become grassi. You God knows in India, before you know you get married, you have children, you start becoming grassa. By the time you retire, you know, you have enough savings on you now, you're relying on your savings, and probably 80 plus, you know, it's a sannyas time. You just give up everything to your kids or grandkids and that's it. So time variable is also there. It is making you go through different stages of life. And then on the third side, you have your occupation. You know, this uh, Brahmin, Kshatriya, Vaishya and Shudra, these are the four nomenclatures for four kinds of professions. So knowledge seeking is one. Security, it could be internal security, that is policing, it could be external security, that is defense or it could be these days cyber security. But that's the second one. Third one is business and commerce or entrepreneurship. And four is services, right? You offer your services to others. So these are the four kinds of divisions of professions. Now, all these three are, these are a combination of 64 combinations you have, and one could choose where you want to be. For example, so I call this as a welfare break. In, in, in economics, we talk about welfare football. So I'm calling this as a welfare break. So these are the three dimensions you're working on. And let's suppose I were to consider a point like A here. To me, this looks like uh, uh, Vijay Malya. No, he is on this axis, Varna axis, he's a Vaishya, he's a businessman. I think he's just busy in Kartha and Kama, right? <laughs> he comes up with calendars every year and whatnot, right? And I think he's a bachelor. So if you take these three, he is here. Look at the other point B. Maybe this is Ms. Dr. Shiva of NASA, uh, of uh, ISRO. The other day when Mangalwa, Mangalyan went to the moon, uh, to the Mars, I was watching the, Dr. Shiva, such a simple man. 
he had his uh, even shirt not even tucked in such a simple fellow so he is a knowledge seeker a brahmin by that definition uh, well of course he is trying to earn uh, money and for his family and so artha and kama is very much there and uh, he is a householder so that point b basically belongs to him somebody could be uh, uh, at point c you know you are 75 80 plus you have done enough things in your life and now you are moksha you are seeking right that point c or you could be at point d this could be a catholic priest he remains bachelor throughout his life but trying for the other worldly good you know or somebody uh, a sanyasi right from the beginning adi shankara acharya you know right from bachelor hood he just was looking at the other worldly things so he could be at point so it is for an individual to choose and one could go through these different 64 points ourselves right so this is the broad context within which the ancient indian uh, in indians were talking about economic life having uh, said this uh, now let me give talk about some proto economic thoughts i'm going to call it pet proto economic thought in different contexts so what about desire and wealth were we just other worldly people i'll give you examples the first of the ancient books you can talk about is rigveda right so let me give you a quote from rigveda i'm going to pick up only few quotes uh, from my book in rigveda it says we follow our desires like a cow follows one one after the other a frog looks forward to a flood i i can you know i'm sure everyone will share with me the first rains and the frogs start croaking so you know, they were anxiously waiting for the first rain imagine all the examples now i am giving here or of what kind of technology we are talking about 3500 years ago and therefore the examples are also coming in that manner but very important example so a frog is looking forward to a flood you know his desire is that an arrowsmith seeks someone who will pay for him in gold a craftsman seeks something that is to be restored and finally a very witty comment a priest seeks worshipers you know when a priest is standing at the pulpit unless they are worshipers he has no value so therefore everybody has desires even even a priest has a desire so very witty comment that uh, rigveda is making so of course they are talking about desires and wealth it's not a, just the other worldly thing that they are talking about i'll give you example from another example from mahabharat you know he here it is uh, this is arjuna telling yudhishthira when yudhishthira was made king you know after the whole war was over and he was made king and as you know yudhishthira every time was like some of our prime ministers very reluctant uh, you know reluctant king and he said no no i want to give up everything and arjuna says no you have to govern and he says you know wealth brings about accession to wealth right so just like domesticated elephants are used to capture wild elephants look at the simile that is he is giving it's like when we talk in hindi sometimes sooth pe sooth you know or capital or capital begets capital that idea is captured by saying just like domesticated elephants are used to capture wild elephants capital begets capital and this is a wonderful idea at that time it was there religious acts pleasures joy courage wrath learning and sense of dignity all these proceed from wealth and this is what arjuna is telling you this should therefore please govern the country is required wealth is required for the country let me also give you a few other examples this pet is basically proto economic thought you know in terms of market failure and charity we all know that markets don't function all the time right why is it that you know in modern times also uh, you know if you join a school sometimes the school is named as like ram bilas sri nivas charitable trust school why is it called ram bilas sri nivas charitable trust school because some rich merchant must have given donation so giving donation or charity was understanding the concept of market failure if left to the market there will not be enough high schools and therefore somebody out of his profits donates and creates a new high school so private sector understand market failure and therefore charity is there and it's a voluntary concept right it's not forced one now to give examples of this rigveda talks about charity it says death comes in various ways even to a well fed person and riches come to her like the rolling of a cart wheel what a wonderful example you know riches come to everyone like a rolling of a cart wheel hence the rich should give arms to the poor who become her friends in the future troubles so this is private sector taking care of market failure that there is no enough for everyone right gita talks about three kinds of charity and here i'm not talking about 
in any dharmic sense not in a religious sense just a one uh, contextual shloka i'm going to quote there are three kinds of charity one is called satvik which is without expectations and the examples you can think of if you have read amar chitra katha you know king janaka or king raghu you know after doing enough accumulating enough well they just decide to give up everything now this is for the society not for me without any expectations that's a satvik charity you can think of then second one is rajas which is grudgingly with expectations you know whether is durga puja or ganesh chaturthi in bombay you know when the young guys come to your doorstep and ask for vargani or that's the uh, you know contribution you know some people will grudgingly give that contribution and what am i going to expect in return are you going to give me show me a good movie so oh, that's the rajas donation you know you are expecting something you are giving grudgingly and then third one is called tamas which is for wrong causes and wrong times now allegedly i hear that uh, mr choksi had given a donation to some uh, foundation you know it, recently it was in the news so maybe that is the tamas uh, kind of donation that we are talking about all right and there is an interesting story by the way if you have been to amdabad and if you have been to akshardham in the evening there is a interesting wonderful sound and light drama show where they show story of vajeshravas and nachiketa so vajeshravas wants to give up everything as donation or charity but then he is a very conceited man he thinks i have earned everything and therefore i am giving these things now while he is giving he gives some cows to somebody and the cow doesn't give enough milk though that dry cows he gives other thing which are not useful so nachiketa his son says father what are you doing these cows are not giving milk they are dry they are going dry why are you giving them they are not useful to somebody else the other things you are giving you know why are you doing this so uh, finally he asks who are you giving me to i am important to you right are you even going to give me also to somebody and vajeshravas the conceited father that he is he just shouts go to hell literally he means i am donating you to the yama right now forget about what happens later you can find out that story what happened later but the idea is this is a tamas charity you know for wrong causes wrong times you are giving and that's tamas all right in west asia the charity is mandated by religious tax in christianity they call it tithe by tithe one tenth is a tithe religious tax you have to pay that's called tithe in uh, islam it's called zakat i think if i am not mistaken 2.5% of your wealth is to be given as zakat or in jewish they call it zedka again 10% of your uh, income is to be given but that's a religious tax so here we are talking about uh, voluntary charity because of market failure now let me give you a few other things on prices and taxation once again i'll go back to rigveda a customer is trying to buy wine which is called soma from a priest as a sacrificial offering customer bids low price and the offering remains unsold for a mere price of 10 cows the needy buyer and the shrewd seller both milk out the order now this is a negotiation being discussed 3500 years ago between a priest and a devotee and when they say they are trying to milk out the order those who have taken economics at undergraduate level understand what is called as consumer surplus and producer surplus the total welfare because of a transaction gets divided into consumer surplus and producer surplus depending on high price if price is very high the consumer surplus is low producer surplus is high if price is very low consumer surplus is low but producer surplus is very high that is what is happening here they are negotiating a price so 10 cows is not the right price right so negotiation doesn't work but basically that they, they are trying to milk out the order again the example that is given is for the technology of those times you know cows and milk and all dairy products was the uh, modern technology then for food processing so they are talking in those terms let me give you other example again from mahabharat this is wonderful a king should tax like bee sucking honey from a flowering plants so in very interesting example when a bee takes honey from a flower it's not disturbing the bloom or the glory of the flower nonetheless when the honey is taken in the same at the same time pollination is occurring and therefore there will be more flowers more fruits in the later period right so this is the idea of taxation which is given in mahabharata further it says 
the tax burden should be enhanced gradually, like a person gradually increases the burden of a young bullock. These are the concepts of Laffer curve and progressive taxation. Of course, it is a proto-economic concept for those times, but that is what the idea is coming through. And if you compare this to Jean-Baptiste Colbert, a French economist in the 17th century, he defined taxation. He says the art of taxation consists in so plucking the goose as to procure the largest quantity of feathers with the least possible amount of hissing. Now, all said and done, this is exploitative in nature. You are making that uh, bird look so filthy after the whole, all the uh, feathers are plucked. Compared to this, taking uh, honey from the bee, sucking the honey from the flower, it's much mature uh, example. You are not only not disturbing the bloom of the flower, that means you are not affecting firms too much. But at the same time, what you procure in terms of honey, that is the taxation, you are leading to pollination. That means you're using it for public goods by the government for in the following years. So this is a very mature example that's given 1,500 years ago. Let me give you one more example. I come back to Kalidasa now, which my mother told me, right? Now in the Raghuvamsham, Kalidasa is saying that state collects tax for the greater welfare of its citizens in the same way as the sun evaporates water turns it into clouds, and in the following year, only to return manifold in the form of rain, right? So therefore, the same Kalidasa who talks about a romantic, uh, you know, Megadutam, is talking about uh, the cloud also as a government treasury. When such kind of uh, similes are being given, one can be sure that the idea of taxation, why government taxes, why it is required for public goods, this idea was very much there in the society. So let me uh, move on. Let me give you some policies uh, stated in the Mahabharata. We all, many of us would know the fiscal deficit concept and the revenue deficit, right? In the past, last first five, six, seven decades, we always, all, we always not only had fiscal deficit, but we had a revenue deficit also. That means government was borrowing just to pay for the salaries of the babus. Forget about spending on uh, dams and infrastructure and other things. So we were just simply not doing ourselves right. This is what Narada is telling uh, Yudhishthira. He says, Narada asks King whether or not he's in his administrative expenses. They are just barely one fourth, one third, or at worst, one half of his income. That means rest should be spent on public infrastructure. This is what Narada is telling uh, in the Sabha Parva when the king is anointed. The concerns were what Narada says, well, do you have enough constructed water tanks, lakes at periodic distances in arid regions? Are you giving loans to farmers at concessional rates? He asked questions on internal security to protect the citizens. He asked whether he takes care of the blind, the dumb, and the lame. That is what the welfare state is supposed to do out of his revenues. And finally, he also says, very relevant for the present times, he says he asks questions in external security and mentions that war should be the last priority for it consumes exchequer, which can be used for other public goods. Isn't India trying to do the same thing today against China? War is the last effort, you know, you're trying all, everything possible, but making sure if required, we'll go for war as well, and therefore government revenues are required, but that's the last priority. I think that was, all this is stated in the Sabha in Mahabharata. So I think this uh, idea of public goods, government using money for the welfare, it's all very much there in our ancient literature. Having given this background, pre kautilyan background, let me come to Kautilya. It cannot be that Kautilya all of a sudden had a revelation. Now, he is not a prophet. So therefore, he must have based his argument based on what happened in the past. And he himself, Kautilya, right in the first chapter, he says, this is my received knowledge. And he says, there is a Brahaspatya Shastra and there is a, you know, Aushanasya Shastra. There are two uh, rishis that he mentions from whom I have borrowed this knowledge, he says. And of course, probably those texts are today not available anymore or yet to be recovered, like what happened to uh, Artha Shastra. But let me now therefore come to Kautilya's policy. Very interesting features of Kautilya's policies. Again, coming back to first on government intervention, same issues are talked about. Tanks, irrigation of canals, roads and waterways, that's a pri primary responsibility of the government. He also talks, by the way, he talks about monopolies. He says, we are giving licenses to some individuals for the uh, extracting minerals from the mines. 
but it's such a highly high cost item fixed costs are so high that you cannot have too many people given these licenses so the moment one person is given one company is the firm is given the license it becomes a monopoly and therefore he says there should be a monopoly tax on the uh, mineral mines so and as the concept of uh, monopoly rates then he talks about leasing of common property resources and what are these common property resources forest lands and pastures again those who have studied economics you know the recorded history of the british economics you know they talked about what is called as tragedy of commons what is the tragedy of commons around a village and i'm sure this happened in every country everywhere but the recorded history that we were told is from england so around a village there is a pasture land it belongs to nobody and therefore it belongs to everybody right so therefore as an individual i would like to graze my cattle on the pasture land because it belongs to nobody and if everybody thinks like this there will be over grazing and if there is over grazing it would mean that in few years there will be no grass left why this happens because there is no private property it's not a private property there is no incentive to protect your own land and therefore concept of leasing has come up right so therefore what government does is it allocates the total uh, pasture land into smaller plots gives it to households of the village and says look you don't own this property but you are given a particular piece of this pasture land your cattle can graze only on this particular piece the moment you introduce this property right of leasing now the farmer says oh my god i cannot overgraze on this plot because tomorrow there will be nothing left and therefore he maintains that grazing land forever right so that's the concept of leasing kautil lai is talking about same thing he is talking about leasing of common property the forest lands and pastures so idea was very much there in ancient india of course he talks about security and protection of private property at the same time um let's look at public finance again borrowing from mahabharata times he says he says that state salaries should not exceed 25% of the total revenue because the rest has to be used for creating assets in the society in the form of dams dharmashalas roads and other things you will not believe this but he had something like a pay commission he defined what is the minimum wage for an unskilled worker and he was refer who was the most unskilled worker he says a palanquin bearer a palanquin bearer is nothing but he carries the load and he does nothing else and he walks that's the least that's the least unskilled worker and he was to be given 16 panas a year that was the minimum wage and he had something like a pay commission he says the maximum salary that can be given to the uh, what will be equivalent of a, let's say a cabinet secretary today will be 48000 panas right so if you see in the range from 60 panas to 48000 panas he has said that wages and salaries differ because skills differ and we respect to we have to have meritocracy and therefore the ratio of 48000 to 60 is quite large right if you compare that to today's uh, uh, central government pay commission cpc huh? what it has done is the minimum salary is 18000 per month for a driver now look the palanquin bearer has become a driver today a car driver he earns 18000 minimum and the maximum for the cabinet secretary is today is 2.5 lakhs this ratio is barely 14 times 2.5 lakhs to 18000 is 14 this ratio should have been much larger i think we have something to learn from kautilya kautilya said meritocracy matters unless you give incentives enough for people to work they will not work now therefore you see lot many ias officers joining private sector because their salaries are much much higher why would i work for 2.5 lakhs unless unless i was not a righteous individual and then corruption sets in because i can't make it right there is a saying and i think xlra and i am amdavad also had done a study on this uh, central pay commission everybody was saying that the low at the lower end 18000 is a very high number compared to private sector private sector gives only 9000 rupees to a driver but government sector gives 18000 and on the other side government gives much less 2.5 lakhs is the maximum salary but look at the corporate sector it could be in crores and crores so therefore this ratio which was much higher top the kautilya made sense maybe we need to learn from kautilya a little bit if not as high as what he has said there could be much wider variability in uh, uh, wages of the uh, pay commission let me talk about taxes he talked about only two rates 5% and 10% on goods 
Today, what has happened? Even after GST has been implemented, they have zero percent, five percent, twelve percent, eighteen percent, twenty-four percent plus the luxury cess. If you are buying a, a Land Rover or something, the moment you have too many tax rates, it becomes difficult to figure out. You no, know, you go to let's say electrical shop. You buy a ten rupee bulb also. You buy expensive heater also. You may buy fuel. Every time the tax rate keeps changing. Now, how the poor fellow electric shop owner is? How is he going to add the GSTs for different items? Simplicity is the hallmark of generating enough revenue. So there should be only few number of tax rates, and that is what uh, Kautilya talked about. Let me also give example of uh, market facilitation. Kautilya talked about control over weights and measures, and what in economics we call this as moral hazard issue. When I buy something from a uh, shop, you know, they, these are, they are electronic machines that, that weigh things. How do I know that's the right thing? I just have to believe that that uh, machine is uh, correct, right? So because then this is a moral hazard problem. Customer doesn't know whether the machine is working well or not, and therefore you need government intervention. So for control of weights and measures, Kautilya said no government will have to intervene. He had a detailed plan for market infrastructure. physical infrastructure where traders could come these are like modern day mandis like apmc market that we are talking about and then look at the um, customs duty he says there should be 20% just one duty is talking about 20% custom duty on imported items and that too he says concession concession can be given if locally similar goods are not available he was talking about free trade and even even in that free trade even if you have custom duty you are talking about only one rate today we have so many different rates on custom duties additional says this that you are it's a nightmare for administration whole idea of taxation is there should be simplicity and that simplicity is lost out which is what uh, kautilya is basically talking about let me talk about interest rates and rent very interesting charging interest was see is was seen in in ancient india as a reward for service that is been offered what is the service if i have surplus funds and i'm just sitting idle on it and somebody else wants to do a business he borrows money from me so i am availing a service of my excess funds to somebody else and for that i get a price and that is the interest rate right you will be surprised in the ancient west it was an anathema it was considered as a sin taking interest was considered as a sin if you are a literature uh, student of literature and if you have um, read uh, merchant of venice you know the famous quote the shiloh of the jewish merchant a uh, uh, banker you know he gives loan to uh, who is that guy um, antonio right and antonio for some reason is unable to pay the rent and he says if then if you don't he says don't charge rent because you know my belief say that i should not be paying uh, i should not be paying interest don't charge me interest right he says okay i will not charge interest but if you fail give me a pound of flesh and antonio agrees but antonio fails in his business venture and time comes to repay the loan and uh, antonio says no i don't have i think you have to take my pound of flesh and then his fiance comes in and you may know that story so antony is almost depressed that now he has to give he has to honor his uh, commitment and he is about to you know uh, take a piece of uh, you know flesh from his thigh and porsia is fiance comes says only a pound of flesh and not a drop of blood and that's what she said that's the contract you should not shed even a drop of blood if you want to take that pound of flesh but you know nice story but behind this story lies the assumption that charging interest was sin and therefore jews were looked down upon because they were charging interest right so aristotle for example same story he disapproved of charging interest he said money is barren how can money produce money same story what arjuna was telling yudhishthira that you know uh, is the domesticated elephant that used is used to capture the wild elephant same story so interest cannot be charged because money is barren Cato, the elder, again Roman philosopher, he said, charging interest is as bad as murder. So basically, in West Asia, interest was not considered as a reward for a service that you are offering. But that's not what that was not the case in the Indian subcontinent. 
interest varied with risk and uncertainty kautilya says that interest varies with risk he says there is a premium on interest if it's you are going by a sea route or if you are going by a forest route if you are going by land route interest risk is, risk is lower so the interest rate will be lower and the lowest rate is if you are taking locally so that means risk interest charge was associated with the risk that uh, the borrowers uh, enterprise in world this was very much known to indians then and of course he would say if you are giving a loan to a soldier highest rate has to be charged you never know whether soldier is going to return right so this was risk related and to add to this just to corroborate this panini the sanskrit grammarian 700 bce he is talking about compound interest and define what is a compound interest the chakravada vyas chakravada vriddhi that's what he is calling and he is talking about daily compounding and monthly compounding so that means in the indian civilization at that time taking interest it was under it was a economic idea it was a economic concept that you are paying a price for somebody's surplus funds and i would like to use those surplus funds Similarly, land rents. You no, know, we know Ricardo. He talked about land rents. You no, know, and rent is decided upon the productivity. Same is being said by Cotillia. Cotillia says he recognized the variation in rent based on rainfall, arability, adaptability of the land, and population density. How much uh, you know uh, population depends on a particular piece of land. So productivity depends on all this, and therefore rent could be accordingly charged. so again very kind of proto economic concept but kautilya talked about in 300 before common era bc let me talk about talk about one a uh, few more thing in labor market again you know very revealing things he talked about daily wage and piece wage uh, piece rate also or a combination of piece rate and daily wage right and we in economics we talk about what is called an efficiency wage you know if you can't monitor the workers then they will shirk right and that was the concept uh, henry ford started henry ford said you know i want uh, uh, you know mechanized production of uh, model t but the moment i have it there are too many workers i cannot monitor them so he said i'll give you more wages but if i find you shirking i'll fire you then no questions asked so there was a carrot and stick approach right that's the efficiency wage approach kautilya is talking about the same thing look what he says offer herbal shampoos to textile women workers at the end of the work if quality is good that means there is a innate understanding of efficiency if you just go by piece rate then quality may suffer if you simply go by wage rate then too many uh, number of items produced will be less because they can shirk and therefore kautilya is saying no give them herbal shampoos at the end of the work if they have contributed enough and the quality is good so herbal shampoo was a incentive given for efficiency right this is what kautilya had thought through it's not that union started only after karl marx came on the scene kautilya's time there were unions and they are called nigamas or nikayas or sanghas and they had arrangements with the government and if you hire somebody you have to inform the union that you know this is the worker this is the person working me and this is the rate i am offering you can read all this in kautilya's arthashastra let me also give a contrast to this of course at times there used to be workers who are called you know broken men you know somebody who has borrowed enough did not pay he become indebted to somebody else or in the wars people have uh, lost their everything and they are ready to become a bonded labor a bonded labor was not really a slave uh, society but somebody could buy oneself out out of the bonded labor if you can save enough then you can buy your bondedness and become free i'm not saying this is the best of the practices but compare that to the western uh, ancient uh, times aristotle said that mass slavery was quite okay but nobody knows this i think the way we have learned our western literature we have kept aristotle on such a high pedestal but nobody talks about his view that mass slavery was just okay in city states in greece that means few families were supported by a mass of um, uh, slaves that was not the case in india and aristotle by the way believed in this so that is in complete contrast to what kautilya is talking about kautilya says that minors cannot be used as labor he also says corporal punishment can never be given and dishonoring of women 
is prohibited. This is like modern HR practices that we are talking about now, which Kotil had talked about uh, in 350 BC. Let me, the, therefore, uh, I can go on and on. I can go on and on. Uh, let me just give you what others have said about the ancient Indian history, which we ourselves don't know, right? Of economic history. Here is Spengler, right? American author. Uh, in his book, he says there was more recognition of the role of price and market in some of the Indian writings than in those of Aristotle, viewed by some as the founder of economics. I think we need to change gears. I think we need to our, let our own people know in our history books or in economic history textbooks. This has to come out, you know. And um, second um, quote, this is Salatore. Salatore says, Cotillia's theory of public finance was both, was both comprehensive and probably the world's most ancient. Let me give you one more by Spengler once again. Spengler says, it is the Arthashastra literature it is in the Arthashastra literature that economic discussion was most highly developed, much more fully than one finds in the classical Greek economics. I think these are accolades enough to, for us to say that these should become part of our history books. They should become part of the economic history that is being taught to our undergrad students, right? So this comes to my final question as to why should we study this, right? What are the takeaways? What are the few takeaways? I mean, uh, you know, uh, Things are there, so what? You know, so what, why should we learn this? I think it's important because of the following reasons. Uh, you know, somebody has said, uh, this is a, a, a science philosopher, uh, he, uh, Michael Roos, he said, science without history is like a man without memory. Imagine if you are a human being, but we, and my mother is 83 today, and she forgets a lot many things. And she's so worried about it. I mean, you are a person who depends on because you remember you have memory. So therefore, science without history is like man without memory. You need to know about the history of your economic science, right? Why should we know it? You know, well, some people say this is vigishness. And vigishness means uh, trying to impose or thrust completeness in the old literature that it all existed before, right? No, I'm not saying that I, there is no way I'm saying that whatever today economics is practice, it all existed in Chanakya or in the earlier literature. That's not the point. What I'm trying to say is there were proto-economic ideas on which modern economics could have uh, developed faster. For example, uh, Schumpeter says, you know, one does profit from visiting the lumber room, provided one does not spend too much time there. I'm saying, no, we don't, have, we don't have to spend too much time, but visiting a lumber room is important for a number of reasons. And I think during my uh, course of this uh, talk, I think I have brought out a few things. If this Indian economic thought was brought to the notice of the Western world, then classical economics would have developed faster. You don't have to wait till the 17th century and reinvent the wheel. This could have happened much earlier had the Indian economic thought got known to the Western world also. And certainly Indian economic thought is not otherworldly. In the first few decades, when we said, you know, Indian economists said this is a Hindu rate of growth, a Hindu equilibrium, that's why we have low growth rates. You couldn't, after 1991, what happened? Average growth rate was 7.5% onwards. Forget about the today's exogenous shocks, whether it's Corona or China or uh, locust or earthquake, earthquakes or cyclones, forget about the, the recent events, but our growth rate was very high. You could not, the, there was no point in saying it was Hindu rate of growth or Hindu equilibrium. I think we are very uncharitable to our own past. And what I'm trying to uh, mention here is that our past was very good. It's just that it did not come to light earlier. Had it come, come to know, uh, people would have come to know about it earlier, classical economics would have developed faster. A few more things before I stop. I talked about taxes, right? It's a bad idea to have too many tax rates. It just creates more administrative problems, creates distortions in the market prices. And that is what Kautila is saying, just two tax rates and just one tax rate for imports. And this is what was coming out of uh, his ideas. I talked about pay commissions. The ratio between the lowest minimum uh, wage and the maximum wa wage was quite high. The difference was very high. And that is simply because there are differences 
in skill sets. If pay commissions don't bring out these differences, even you know some of you must be uh, faculty members in other colleges and universities. You know what are our increments? Where is the incentive to do further good things in life? You know, I once I become full professor, there are no increments, right? Sure, then one would like to do moonlighting. I'm not saying in a positive sense probably, but you know the fact is that you know all five fingers are different. Therefore, the difference that pay commission bring in has to be much wider. Otherwise, top IS officers will leave and go for private sector jobs. And at the lower level, you know, there is just not enough productivity. Finally, an important thought, which comes from the Indian economic thought. You know, dharmic approach to economic policies is required. And when I say dharmic, what is dharmic? It is coming back to us now. When in the recent economic survey, you know, there was talk about nudging behavior. That's behavioral economics revisited. What uh, Indians were saying earlier. When you say you have to have dharma, artha, kama, moksha, four objectives of life. Dharma means ethical conduct, right? When prime minister has big holdings saying that give up your gas subsidy, it is appealing to your dharmic reactions. It's saying be ethical. If you don't need the subsidy, somebody else is going to get that subsidy. Don't use that subsidy, right? And ultimately, of course, we are now, we don't have that uh, gas subsidy. This is behavioral economics for you, which was thought through earlier. And that is a dharmic idea. Uh, even uh, uh, Amartya Sen, you know, he calls this, he doesn't call it dharmic act, but he calls it commitment. He says, let's say you are walking on the street and you see somebody being beaten up. I'm not giving the example of uh, Mr. Dubey, but uh, <laughs> if somebody is being beaten up, if you feel pity for the other person and therefore you help, it's increasing your own utility. That is going by the standard economics argument. My utility goes up because I help somebody else. But the dharmic approach is, the ethical approach is that no beating somebody else is wrong and therefore I'm helping somebody else. That's the dharmic idea. Right? That's not utilitarian idea. And that comes through in other, other economic um, activities also. Ethical behavior in borrowing. Now, th this is non-Malya, non-Niramudi behavior. You borrow from public, you borrow from the banks using same letter of credit many times over and you fool everybody and you leave the country. Now, economics is unable to control these behaviors. How many controls you put in place? How many regulatory bodies you are going to put in place, right? So something has to come from your ethical behavior and which comes from your culture. I talked about charity already, right? So these are also approaches which are also important in economic life. And so uh, Indian, Indian economic thought was much more broader. It was much more mature. It was not a unidimensional approach and many things could have been, are still relevant. And from that perspective, I think looking at economic history, taking a telescopic view is also important. I think uh, I will stop here. A professor can go on and on. So uh, before I, I'm not a professor of marketing. <laughs> Nonetheless, I'll try to market my book. <laughs> interested more, I've just given you a glimpse of what I have discussed in my book. The title is Economic Sutra, Ancient Indian Antecedents to Economic Thought. Please try to uh, get a cold copy of it and I'll, I'll be happy to get feedback. And over to uh, Sanjay, if there are any comments, questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Satish. Uh, as I said uh, in the beginning that, you know, you make uh, classes enjoyable and though you had said it's a serious topic but let me honestly tell you i enjoyed every single minute of it to the extent that i can't make a summary of what you have said i was too busy listening to you rather than making a note of what you are saying and Thank indeed you. i would recommend everyone to read this book that's so wonderful uh, i had asked people to type uh, their questions in the chat box yeah. And there are so many questions that I think you will have to take one more session on this, but let me start still ask by asking a few questions. The yeah. first yeah. one, I am not able to find it out now, but right now, but it was about, uh, do you have something in ancient texts about uh, our depression and uh, the kind of economic environment we are going right now? Uh, so is there anything about that also? Meanwhile, let me find out other questions. Yeah, so uh, no, no formal, I mean, depends on what uh, uh, period one talks about. And uh, the amount of 
uh, recession, depressions, overheating of the economy, the business cycles is a, re is a recent thing. Uh, in the olden times, business cycles were not that common, except to the fact that exogenous shocks like drought, you know, would hit the economy or foreign aggression would hit the economy. You know, these were the two important exogenous shocks which could create depression or recession in an economy, right? And as I said, the public works that Gav that uh, Kautilya talks about were to take care of these things. So it was a built-in uh, feature, uh, not as a separate policy tool, macroeconomic policy tool, but the, the innate idea was uh, very much there. But I can share one example. Uh, from After writing this book, uh, I received so many you know, feedbacks from many people who read. Now I'm working on another piece. Uh, I'm working on uh, Shukra Niti Sara. Because Kautilya mentions that he borrowed this from Shukra Niti. So I said there must be something called Shukra Niti. So there is a text of the medieval era, which uh, is the abridged version of Shukra Niti Sara, of Shukra Niti. So I'm working on that uh, uh, Precise right now, and there is one example given there that in recessionary times, and this is in the West what they call is uh, debt jubilee. A debt jubilee is that in a recessionary time you just pardon all the debt because if you don't pardon the debt, then people will not spend because they will have to keep paying their debt and the interest. And if they are unable to pay because of some whatever reasons, then just pardon all the debt so that people can start spending and therefore demand will get revived. So this idea comes in Shukraniti. In Shukraniti, uh, uh, many of you uh, uh, seniors would know there was a concept called Dam Dupat. If there is a relation between a borrower and lender, and Dam Dupat meant that if the interest component exceeds twice the principal, after that, borrower need not pay. The reason is that if I mean, you know, sooth pay sooth, right? That's the idea. Uh, lenders can uh, keep extracting uh, interest from the borrowers, right? And during recessionary, and this is to take care of the problem during recessionary times, debtors won't be able to pay the debt or the interest component. And so there was a rule uh, place, what is called Dam Dupan, that if your interest exceeds twice the borrowed amount, after that, you need not pay. This was also one of the policies to take care of the recessionary tendencies. So maybe in that sense, I've ordered, uh, answered your question. Okay, Prachi wants to ask a question. Prachi, please uh, start your audio and you may ask your question. Meanwhile, uh, Satish, there is a question on Facebook. How does ancient, uh, oh, sorry, how, how, how does ancient Indian economy has dealt with issues like fight of farmers, hoarding of goods, adequate market place, places, that's what it says, justifiable prices, etc. Uh, <clears throat> on markets, uh, well, I talked about market facilitation. So Kautilya clearly gives uh, a, a whole city plan and how market should be set up. Where should be their offices? Where should be the go-down? Where should be the um, actual transaction taking place? So he has an explicit discussion of this. Uh, second, you talked about hoarding. Well, the concept of hoarding in... Uh, can be looked at from both sides. And uh, in, for, I know for sure in Shukra Niti Sara, he clearly says that traders store good because, and I'm converting it in modern time, in modern uh, language, because there is time utility. At the time of harvest, everything is harvested. If you sell everything right away, prices will plummet naturally. Farmers will not benefit at all. And why would they produce for the next year, right? So the trader serves the purpose of, of time utility. He stores when the harvest is there, the prices will be a little lower, but you need to feed the people till the 11th month, till the next harvest comes through. There's a time utility associated with uh, quote unquote holding that you're talking about, right? In fact, uh, I don't like the word holding. It's a uh, utility that is created by traders to uh, it's uh, intertemporal uh, smoothing of consumption. That's what is happening. Satish, uh, Prashant asks the question, don't you think Kautilya's Arsash is best fit to be called as geoeconomic principles? It has rules, guidelines for a king to rule, how to rule and govern. So blend economics and geopolitics. At the same time, Bhavik is asking a question on, uh, on Zoom. 
uh, can dharma and economic be separable? What role does dharma play? So I think these two questions are interrelated. I thought I will ask at the same time. Yeah. So the first one, yeah. So what I have tried to do is I have looked at the only uh, economic antecedents in the ancient literature. But Kautilya he was not just an economist. I mean, he wrote a piece on, um, it's called that, uh, uh, on polity. So it incurs polity. It's, you can say science of political economy. He talks about continuance of the state. He talks about foreign aggressions. He talked about army. How So he went about uh, talking many other things than just economics. My idea was to focus on, as an economist, I was to focus on the economic ideas. But you are right. <laughs> he talked about other important things in life also. Uh, namely politics, uh, continuance of governance, good governance, uh, protection from foreign aggression, and many, and he had uh, different theories about it. So that can be a separate uh, topic. I think that has been addressed much more than the economic side. And um, well, uh, today if you go to any airport, you will find so many management books on Arthashastra, management and Chanakya. But when I read that uh, title as management, I think no, it was more of economics than management. But economics being part of management school at IMA, I think I should write this. That's the first one. Second one was about dharma and economics. Yeah, not true. I think uh, you know what happens is we become specialized in our own fields. Therefore, I look only at economic aspects. A political scientist will look only at the political aspects of it. A defense expert will look only at the defense aspect of what is coming through it. But at the end of it, it's a jigsaw puzzle, and everything is interrelated to the extent. That I talked about four purushartas, four ashramas, and four occupations. That combination of 64, I think that is the integration of dharma and economics together. And we have to keep that at the back of our minds. And uh, therefore, my last slide, I talked about the dharmic perspective into economic policies. That's, uh, I think, very much relevant. So you are right that way. Satish Shunakshi wants to know was there any mention of fiscal and monetary policies uh, in ancient texts? There's no specific mention of monetary policy, but there are uh, paragraphs by Kautilya on minting of coins. He says how much coin should be printed, and there are two, by, just like we have ch uh, right, uh, checkable deposits and currency, right? He talked about two kinds of currencies. He talked about um, um, one that is minted by the government, and the other that is minted by the traders. The one that is minted by traders could be used for regular purposes in the market, but if you want to pay taxes or fees or fines, it had to be in the coins that were minted by the government. So it was like legal tender and the commercial tender. So those differences certainly they knew, but it was not used in the context of printing more money when there is a recession. That kind of idea I think was not developed by then. But fiscal policy, yes. I think in terms of public good generation, taxing people and using it for generating dams, construction of other roads and other infrastructure, and maintaining your revenue deficit, uh, not ex not having positive revenue deficit, these ideas certainly come from the uh, fiscal policy angle, which were known to them. But these detail also, uh, is there any appetite for current Indian economists who advise government on economic policies to follow ancient Indian wisdom to resolve current day economics problems faced in the country. Basically, he says that is there are there people listening to you or not in government? Well, uh, I think economists have to be extremely humble. You have to offer what you have. It's for the politician to choose whether they want to choose or not, right? For example, certainly, I mean, you know, why why did GST come into place? Because prior to GST, there were multiplicity of taxes. So we came down to only one tax, right? But within that one tax, there are so many rates. So again, it's going, you're going back in some sense to too many taxes, tax rates. So that the uh, work of the administrators has gone up once again. I think it's easier if there's maybe, if not one, there should be maximum two tax rates. Things become much simpler. And you can, it's like honeybee sucking the honey from the flower. Don't disturb the company, don't disturb the market place by having too much administrative setup. I think that some certainly comes out of this. Or even pay, I talked about pay structure, right? Don't have a narrow pay structure. Then there's no incentive to work among the administrators. Why would top best administrators work for government? 
they will go to corporate sector and uh, a driver in a public sector gets 18000 rupees a driver in public sector gets only only 9000 rupees why a driver in a private sector gets only 9000 rupees because that is the only thing you can do it without reading if you pick up driving you can do from place to place you are doing a service 9000 rupees is on an average paid but in the government you are paying 18000 so that means the relative incentive we give i mean the skilled workers and unskilled worker goes down where is the efficiency going to come in i think this is another aspect which pay commission should consider so hopefully somebody is listening <laughs> so satish so, there are, there are actually few more challenges uh, i know some people may get upset with what i am saying for example in banks if you hire a peon after some time he is eligible to become a clerk or you have to make because of departmental promotions now the the competencies of a peon is different from competencies of a clerk now that fellow may be serving customers he has not been trained for that right. and you know then one day he will get or he or she will get further promotion no right. you are not geared for that competencies you have not you know you have not learned that and that creates other kind of service delivery problems in bank so you know uh, automated promotions are very very challenging things to do in uh, in uh, in government no, very true in fact uh, shukraniti does talk about it by the way shukraniti says that competency and age have nothing to do with each other <laughs> you know is one shloka then there is the other one uh, similar one um, uh, well i'll come back to it later yeah so uh satish sanjay says that not my sanjay sanjay garg says that you know we have such a le rich legacy in so many fields and why are we today so poor practically in every field of innovation and research should we continue to just bask in ancient glory or lay a pathway for the future i think more as a economist uh, rather than economist more as a professor you can answer this question yeah no i mean there is nothing permanent about any civilization you know Greeks were at one time great, but look where Greece and Italy is today. Rome and Greece, where are they today? Or China? So if there's a Weber's theory of civilizations. You know, you go up and down. That's bound bound to happen. Only thing is, you should pick up the good things from all civilizations. What I'm trying to say is, there are good things in our own civilization, past civilization also, but we have somehow forgotten because of our colonial history. So maybe we want to revive some of those things. You know, and that's how I'm putting it. Ayush has a counter question, Satish. He says more difference in lower and higher skill workers, which isn't it going to have more rich and poor gulf? It's possible, but you know, five fingers are not same, and nature. You know, what we do depends on two things. One, uh, in what environment we are brought up. and how many folds are given to our brain by the nature these two things really decide what we can do right therefore we should contribute according to our abilities and we get paid according to our abilities where does the government come in government comes in therefore as a welfare state for given common things road infrastructure should be good for everyone dam construction of road should be facilitated for everyone defense should be for so social security should be for everyone and including internal security today in up if police were and politicians were doing a good job of internal security even a person who is not that well off will be happy but even the rich today in in up may not be happy right so therefore wage differences will exist because of differences in productivity that's that's nature what we are saying is as a welfare state that should be compensated through the public infrastructure by the government and that much uh, responsibility of course government should do but not in terms of the equating wages that will never happen because that will not give incentive for good people to work more satish just to share with you that in public sector banks uh, which may have uh, maybe business of 1000 lakhs of crores maybe their salary the ceo salary will be around 2 lakh rupees per month only and you know they have the business they are managing is so big with thousand around more than 25000 40000 people True. you know uh, they deserve better salaries better uh, maybe uh, facilities and all but whenever uh, government or someone tries to talk about that you know there are questions of this gap there is a question on facebook by janak bhai uh, he was our hmp student he says can you provide insights of penal system mentioned by cotillia in current context 
penal system. Uh, uh, there are, I have not looked at it closely because not as an economics uh, student, I have looked at only a few things from the treatise, but I, but rest assured there are, uh, there is a chapter on that as well. What kind of penalty, there is a separate chapter on judiciary and what kind of punishments can be given. It's very much there, but I won't be able to uh, right away comment on it because it's not directly related to economic aspects, but it's Janak very much there. Janak Mai continues asking tough questions after two years yeah, of his stay here also. Uh, I think Satish, there are a lot many questions. I will take one last one. Uh, any comments on demonetization? Yeah, uh, I think it has to be looked at both from economic point of view and political. So it's a political economy argument, I would say. Uh, on the economy side, of course, there was certainly um, uh, inconvenience to people. Uh, Agreed. I think I wrote a blog on that as well at that time. And uh, you search for my blog from Newton to, I, I think that blog is, if you type on Google, from Newton to Namo. And I think that explains the whole argument there as to why it was a pol expedi expedient as political economy uh, argument. Uh, it creates a, uh, it creates a potential threat in the minds of uh, black marketeers. But tomorrow you can do this again. Even with China, what has happened is we have created a potential threat that you know we are no more 1962 India, right? So demonetization, there might have been economic losses, and that's bound to happen in the short run. But I think more than that, it created an environment that this can happen again. And that I think fear has been instilled for some time. And I think from that point of view, it was okay. But I see that there were issues in implementation. Believe me, I think uh, Sanjay talked about computation of CAT earlier. Whatever you do in India for 1.25 and 1.3 billion people, it's not easy. It's much more probably easier in populations where the density is much lower and absolute numbers are also lower. For us, it's a gargantuan task. So therefore, we should take that with a pinch of salt for sure. But I think it sent a message to the people. Satish, I am inclined to ask one more question. Maybe that will be the last one. There are a few more coming. So Vidula is asking a question about distribution economics getting aligned with Kautilya Shastra. Distribution economics. Yeah. Are you talking about income distribution or the supply chain distribution? I am no economist, Satish. <laughs> so Vidula has to explain that very quickly. Uh, before that, uh, yeah, income. She says income distribution. Yeah. yeah. So uh, as I, I think I talked about earlier on to someone, uh, because we are made different by nature, right? There will be productivity differences amongst us. Only therefore there will be differences in salaries and therefore distribution is not going to be ideal in any case. However, one could minimize the real distribution, not in terms of non nominal distribution, but real distribution in terms of government creating more infrastructure so that everybody is brought to the same level on many of the common things, right? And it, for example, education. So somebody should not be able to say that, you know, look, I'm not an IS officer today because I did not get uh, education opportunity. That certainly uh, responsibility lies with the government to that extent that uh, equity in opportunity should be brought in by the government. Rest, I think, we'll have to leave it to the uh, forces of market uh, and nature. Okay, uh, Satish, uh, I think uh, we, there was one last question. This is certainly last, I promise, Satish. Uh, okay. How does one reflect role on the reflect on the role of India's caste system in shaping India of today? Yeah, good question. I thought this will come. At least one of the questions will come. In fact, if you read my book, I have whole one chapter dedicated on Varna, Jati, and caste. There are three different things. <laughs> and I spend a whole chapter on it. Uh, maybe I'll just give one gist of it and then we can stop. Uh, if you look at the ancient Indian literature, you know, there is a sacred literature and there is a secular literature. Now, Vedas, Upanishads, these are sacred literature. And when somebody talks about Manusmriti, that's a secular literature. What do I mean by that? No, 
today's our india's constitution was made in 1950 it's a secular text right it has nothing to do with religion similarly at every point in time at different stages of uh, india's history or any country's history you have to have laws to govern yourself so manusmriti for example was the constitution of those times and no constitution is perfect no constitution is ideal and it's a open architecture so if you look at the uh, sacred literature when you talk about varna brahmin kshatriya vaishya and shudra they were not castes but they were they were occupations and it is based on guna karma it is not based on birth in fact i'll go one step further i'll give you one example quickly and then i'll stop ambedkar himself i have referenced this in my book he says that many of you would know the um, uh, the ritual of what is called as upanayana some call this monji vrata monji vrata bandha upanayana right thread ceremony ambedkar says this ceremony was done by guru or acharya after 12 years of education in a ashrama by the students the student would leave home go to ashrama spend 12 years learn in different things in 12 years the guru would know who is good at doing what and accordingly upanayana was done then that was a commencement ceremony or convocation ceremony and then you became either a brahmin or a kshatriya or vaishya shudra according to what now you are supposed to do what you have learned right eventually it so happened that in manusmriti manusmriti manu said you know why wait for 12 years send before you send your child to the ashrama do his vrata bandha and that kind of in some sense led to the freezing of the caste system right the varnas or jatis and therefore today we have lingering effect of those uh, for sure but i don't think in today's context uh, for example whoever is a uh, you know a isro scientist are the brahmins of today right a painter or an artist is a shudra by going by that word offering artistic services that's a shudra right offering services so these are the contextual uh, terms today they have no meaning in terms of birth for sure but the fact that we continue it there is a reason for it probably i am not going to justify that reason the reason being that you know many times you get on the job training at home why is it that amitabh bachchan's son should become an actor again because he gets that training at home probably or he gets little leads because of his parentage and therefore he also becomes follows the same profession as his father right so to lot of extent maybe sometimes families give you a nudge and you occupy the same you take the same occupation occupation why is it that the son of a lawyer becomes a lawyer because there is a on the job training available and therefore quote unquote caste system gets permeated it appears as if it is birth based right but there is no i mean, technically speaking it's not birth based at all it is based on guna karma yeah thanks thanks a lot satish uh, i would let me thank all the audience all people who came uh, on zoom as well as on facebook today to listen to you we had a large gathering thanks to all of you please do come next week also satish thanks from all of us to you for taking time and delivering this wonderful session there are not many people who are requesting that you should come again and again at least once again to answer so many questions that are there and i am sure you will come once again with us on not only on sure. this topic but on many other topics also thanks a lot sure. satish thanks to my all pleasure. of the audience both my on pleasure. zoom as well as facebook thanks satish thanks thank you my pleasure and you can thank see you. thanks coming on chat screen now satish yeah Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.